Linda. I'm Z. And we're A to Z Family, family Farms. farms. <laughs> I'm Stephanie, I'm Mom. <laughs> and I'm Jared, I'm Dad. I'm Luke, I live here, and I'm a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> We are here in Corrales, New Mexico with A to Z Farms and we're going to talk about, what is this room? <laughs> so, so this is our hoop house. Uh, we're considering our, our greenhouse, I guess. Um, but this is, we started plants here about two months ago from seed and then we grow them up until mainly a couple weeks ago and we planted the majority of them, so hundreds, thousands of plants in our field. Um, but they all start here as seedlings. Right. So if you can see here, we have our eggplant that we're gonna try putting out for our tomatoes. Um, we already did our first round of tomatoes outside and eggplant and cabbage. Cabbage isn't, but the other two are warm season, so they can't get frost on them. Um, we also planted spinach and other stuff in the field. What else we plant here? Herbs, the herb garden started in here also. Right, so we started most of the herbs in here also. So the goal of this room is to keep um, seedlings going and then transplant them into the field for to increase hopefully the growth and so they're more uh, robust when they're out. In we the also field. put some seeds directly in the field but it just depends how well they do and what the weather's like and whether they can handle the dryness that's going to be out there. Here they're babied and this is you know the nursery for plants where they're babied and treated like <laughs> Outside of here, I saw that there were some bees. Can we talk a little bit about those guys? Okay, so these are the little bees that I was talking about. Can you tell me a little bit about them and what they do here at your farm? They are, well, they're new additions to the farm. They're an Italian hybrid, so they're not aggressive. So obviously, they're okay with us being this close. Um, and actually, there are people on the farm that handle them. But they hopefully will make sure we have lots of tomatoes and cucumbers so and... But a lot big reason for the bees um, to complete our ecosystem that we're working on is to help pollinate some of our vegetables and herb garden. So we're hoping these guys will help us pollinate um, our field and then they can go to the bosque down here by the river and get much more pollen and then they'll produce also a lot of honey and comb. So I guess this one is the top bar, top, top bar. bar. So the top bar has the triangle type combs that come down and it produces um, I guess half comb, half honey. And I'm sure we'll do something, candles, I'm not sure what we'll do with it. <laughs> but it's also important to support the bee population in this country or in the world because um, the extin extinction, the bee extinction problem is a problem for everyone. So. Hopefully we can expand our beekeeping situation also and, and help contribute to that situation much more. And since this is an organic farm and there's no pesticides or herbicides being sprayed, it's a good place for we're them. hoping that it's going to give us um, better the bee population. We do know there's some apple orchards down there they might spray, um, but bees do travel in a three mile radius from their hive. Um, so hopefully they don't get into anything or not. But, um, plant a lot of flowers and other type stuff to keep as many here as possible. Guys, what part of the farm are we in right now? So this is this is plot D. They're all a hundred foot. Um, and this is Luke. He's our plant specialist. Hey Luke. So he's the one that does a lot of the planting and right now we're sitting in our kale patch um, and Luke can tell you more about the kale, the planting, the different rotation methods, why we interplant higher crops with lower crops. Um, this bed for the spring and fall is dedicated to brassica family, which is your kales and cabbages. And that makes it much easier to rotate. Um, but mostly everyone wants fresh greens. So having kale in cycles where there's some here started and then there's seeds behind us is really important to cycle the crops and then interplant this with something taller that's going to give back to the soil like sorghum later. So he says give back, that means pull up new nitrogen, it, put it different minerals back in. It pulls up and mines different nutrients, it suppresses weeds and forms a, a natural compost. So the goal is here to build soil. Um, new Mexico has very, very ancient sand, which is 126 million years to undecomposed. 
So if you speed up that process chemically and with roots and plants, we've got some of the best soil in the world. And just to remind uh, the people that are watching this, this is an organic farm. Yes. What does that mean? It means we don't use, well, organic as far as the USD is limited pesticides and things like that. We don't use anything that's not food grade. We will use diatomaceous earth and natural methods to control soft bugs. But our primary method is to create an ecosystem where predator bugs thrive. And that pretty much takes care of the problem. Is yep. that how some of the bees come into play or? Bees are actually just mostly good pollinators and we all eat a lot of honey here. Right. <laughs> um, but it's more small wasps and soil nematodes ladybugs, praying mantids, things like that, that really help control the populations of your pests. And if you make a habitat for your predators, then you have a much healthier ecosystem. Yes, there's bugs here, plenty of them, but the fact that they're balanced is what makes it a real ecosystem. And that's why we focus on organic farming. Can you tell me a little bit about how it is that you guys rotate the farms or how it is the crops, I'm sorry, and also the differences between what you you put during the summertime or the winter time can you tell me a little bit about that so in the in the cool season we have a very short spring here it's pretty much freezing and then it turns to summer <laughs> um, a couple hot days in between but come august we have some pretty cool nights and a nice long cool season in the fall so you have to tailor your plants according to a quick spring and a long fall but that's what the kale is, is the cool season. And in the summertime, use your taller plants like beans to help shade these things to get them, keep them going. Because if it does get really hot, especially for peas and things like that, they'll just die. So you want to make sure everything is almost perennial. Um, and we've got this huge wall over here with reflective heat. And that gives us a really interesting microclimate here. Our field's only about 70 feet wide and that warms a quarter of it. When I went over to the ditch, I also noticed that most of the ditches were made of dirt and yours was not. Can well, you tell me a little bit about that? We'll have to thank uh, the old property owner, Mr. Joe Trujillo, for building all these block walls. Um, but over by the wall, there is an actual block wall that is our ditch. And we have a couple, three gates that will increase it. So we have very minimal water loss. And when we put in our actual gates, we should be able to control our water um, quite well, meaning we're not going to waste much water compared to, the, say, the dirt ditches where they have a huge infiltration rate before they even get to the property in question that's being uh, flooded. So this allows us to save water. I mean, if we wanted to, we could even put um, some sort of gauges and actually gauge all water we put onto this field because of this ditch so it makes it very convenient minimal clean out um. the other thing is they built it because it actually extends another mile behind you to the west half mile and it waters other alfalfa fields the river is behind us so to get water all the way up there with a dirt ditch is very very difficult um, so when he built this wall it did a few things for us. It provided reflective heat, a really clean, efficient canal, but it also gives us the ability to control our water so we can easily put in floodgates and open and close water as we need to and have sections that we do more of a dry farming method with less drip irrigation and areas where we do a lot more wet crops. So we can get way more biodiversity here than you normally could. So the first time that I was here, uh, a couple days ago, of course, I was in my heels. Thank God today I'm in uh, tennis shoes. Um, I ate like half your farm, and the only thing that I could not get out of my mind is how I can't go back, I've, especially after a radish and this, it, it's the, the spinach, it's just um, the kale. It, the, the, the way that it tasted, I want to ask you why is it that when I tasted these radishes that were so watery, I mean, it, it had a very different flavor than even the organic that I thought I was buying at the store. Well, last year this was all in alfalfa field. And as far as organic nutrients are concerned, kelp and alfalfa are fairly competitive with 17 amino acids and minerals. Alfalfa has 16, but it can grow on land. It's got deep roots, 
it fixes potassium, which is something that's hard to fix. And what I focus on here is not so much the plants, it's the soil. And the fungus inside of the soil, mycorrhizae, opens up more nutrients to a plant. So even though you're eating a smaller carrot, it's got as much nutrition as a big carrot. It takes longer to grow, but the fungal relationship in a plant mostly is below the ground. Two thirds of a plant should be below the ground. That's the part that we're focusing on. So this leaf has more nutrients in it than something that's growing in a poorer soil. Even if the soil is rich and the can't, plant can't put it in. But at the same time, if we're comparing it to say store-bought, even organic, um, we get organic heirloom seeds. Um, we don't use any chemical supplements on it. And if you compare it to the grocery store, a lot of them knows even if they say organic, some are probably genetically modified to create a longevity, not necessarily for taste. Um, a lot of grocery stores spray their plants down with some waxy glycerol type coating to keep the colors. Um, if you know in the grocery store, you know all the apples and everything are perfect or all the kale is perfect. Um, here, I think it's perfect. It has a couple poles. <laughs> <laughs> but we have bugs to take care of those bugs. Um, so we don't take this anywhere. The goal is also for sustainability where we decrease transportation. We would like to sell to our local community so it comes directly from our farm, doesn't go over a mile and into directly somebody's salad. I could pretty much say everything we sell here gets eaten within a week or two and if I don't sell it I take it over to the homeless grocery store and donate it to people who can't get fresh produce. Right. Um, and last time I was there it just flew because it's all cans and can't get fresh lettuce anywhere, much less organic, and imagine paying the prices if you're homeless. So, to bring fresh food to those who need it, it's available. And, and the fact that it's going to waste is, is our fault. So, so we try limiting we're that as trying much to as fix possible. that system right. first. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Anything that, so that doesn't amazing. get eaten by us gets filtered through, and I feed it to the chickens. And if that's not edible, it goes to the compost. And I've been right. composting for the businesses we sell to, and, um, and, and the local co-op. And talking about composting, I mean, another one of our goals, hopefully in the next year or two, is in theory is going to be no till. So we'll just put compost on top of these beds All these and keep on will grow be on white clover forage for the bees and that will help bring them down to a level where they help to pollinate the plants. And it'll decrease it weeding for us. It also fixes nitrogen. I use inoculants on my seeds, so your standard white clover fixes like 160 pounds. We use a New Zealand which fixes 220 and then with an inoculant it fixes 270. So 270 pounds of nitrogen per acre being added pretty much right at the roof available level. There's tomato. Yeah, they're everywhere. So there's a weeding yeah. issue, a lot of weeding to do here. We're working on that one. <laughs> what about tilling the, the soil? I spoke to another farmer, Rachel, from Little Dirt Farms, and she spoke to me about tilling. What is, I just assumed every single farm was tilled with machinery. And can you tell me a little bit about that and why you guys? So to start this out, we had to get rid of the mass cover and till everything in, but it also gave us a lot of nutrients. From that point, organic farming rule number one is no bare soil. You talk about evaporation and the dust bowl. It bakes the soil. It bakes it and then the wind blows it away, especially in the springtime here. So we have to keep that soil covered all the time, even if it's weeds. Weeds are better than bare dirt. Um, but to form these beds into a productive farm that we could then cover was the first step. So now the goal is not to do as much or any tilling and put nutrient rich compost on top of it and then of course rotate the crops do not put kale here next season but put whatever the inverse of <laughs> kale <laughs> and that's something that's important right when you are growing a plant that it has the nutrients that you're putting in it from the previous season is that right you do want to balance out the soil so every plant takes pounds per acre is how it's determined and corn for an easy example takes about 500 pounds of nitrogen out of your soil per season. So you have to put approximately, yeah, per acre, 500 pounds of nitrogen back somehow. And a clover that fixes 270 will help with that. 
cutting down the corn and leaving it there will help with some of that. And then growing a cover crop, we're using a heavy, heavy compost. Compo compost can be so heavy in nutrients that it'll kill weeds. And you put it down, let it sit over the winter, and then you have a bed ready to plant that's nutrient rich in the summertime. Right. So you notice it's not any monocropping at all here. It's a variety of different stuff in each plot. That's for a couple of reasons. One, we like the variety, but at the same time, it affects the bugs, it changes the ecosystem, and definitely changes the nutrients we're pulling from the soil, and of course, what we're putting and back. And if bugs do get out of hand, we'll eventually, I mean, you destroy a crop if they get too crazy. Uh, that's the way we would do it here. We still wouldn't spray. Yeah, we didn't. So this gives us some control on what crops we destroy, and gives us some division between similar crops and we can still have diversity for for economic reasons. Right, we're trying to isolate certain crops. You won't so make that much money if you just grow lettuce, but if you have all these <laughs> kinds of things and sell a little bit and each one makes so much, then you have a pretty good chance of, of making it as a farmer. But if you don't have that and you're monocropping, you're introducing your plot to a lot of different problems down the road. So we're so trying you, to think of the future. You guys mentioned the word monocropping a couple of different times, and remember this is the girl that showed up for an interview in high heels. So can you explain to me please a little bit about what that word means? And so monocropping is, is planting the same crop in mass in land. So in, instead of having all these crops, this would be a corn field, or it would be an alfalfa field, or a soybean field. And more and more of Americanized farming is becoming huge plots. Of that's mostly corporatized. Supplemented crops. Heavy industry, large companies. And to break that down is a challenge. It's a lot more work because you can't then have soybean that's Roundup ready and you spray everything and the weeds go away. But by doing monocropping, you're eventually just ruining the soil. And in the 30s during the Dust Bowl, we had a monocropping issue. When we got out of World War I, we turned our military industrial complex onto the farms. And it's stuck that way ever since. We use mass tractors, combines, it's a military organized operation almost. Very efficient. And it's very, very efficient. Very but hard nothing the soil. goes back to the soil. Right, takes everything from it. In fact, we end up throwing a lot of that food away. Um, and it shouldn't be thrown. So to grow what you need and grow what you want and get more diversity out of the whole thing benefits really everyone. And then you don't have mass insect problems that are attacking one crop. You don't have pesticide issues and you don't have a typical loss of fertilizer. I would like to change the paradigm where the soil goes to small local farming. So you don't have these huge industries that are charging a lot of money for throwing food away. We grow what we need transportation costs, very little waste, we recycle via composting, and then we create an economy here for ourselves. Everybody else gets much higher grade food and, and knows exactly where it's coming from. And that's the, the true goal of our sustainable farm thing we have going on here. Um, well, I mean, they say in, in theory, if, the, if 18 wheelers weren't supplying Albuquerque, it would run out of food in about nine days. Wow. And it's surrounded by these farmlands that actually could supply if we're organized. Right. So there's no reason food should be traveling from Mexico and Florida hundreds of miles. And even corporations like Sprouts are sending their trash to Arizona to compost. Which is their so compost we're, we're waste. Trash. Well, um, compost. plant waste that could be used to compost locally. Local farmers could and, use it for pigs and chickens. And they're they very good it. too compared to other grocers. Mm -hmm. So, so they can always be improved, and I think the way it gets improved is by creating a demand for local food. Right. Um, that system is really a, what a farmer's market and a local farm is all about. We could supply all of the neighbors and people in need locally. Right. Um, no problem. And then if we're not the only ones doing it, it suddenly changes the game. And grocery stores. Aren't, aren't the place people go for produce, they go to farms, which is where it started and where it should, should be. be. Yep. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Can we go ahead and 
when I drove in, I saw that there were like little chicken condos and there were some chickens in there. Can we go over there and talk a little yeah. bit about those guys? Yes. <laughs> we are with the chickens. So can you tell me a little bit about what this housing structure is? So this is what we consider our chicken tractor. I believe there's four or five hens and one rooster in it. Um, and so what it is, it's on wheels and it's mobile. So we move it every other day. Um, and you can see how in front of it, you have a bunch of alfalfa and other weeds. Um, so this is one way of somewhat free ranging the chickens, but still protecting them from the hawks. And then you can see behind the chicken tractor after they've scratched and um, done their business, that it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be other soil that's you know, richer in, in, in nutrients. And they're also working for us. Um, but if we keep them moved, it's kind of a pseudo free range. Um, they're in cages because we do have some raccoons and some hogs, I guess. Yeah, that come around. Um, so then we water them and we pull the thing every couple days to help them this work. So the chickens can actually be part of our farm hands. Yes, last time I was here, we saw a hawk and he looked like uh, he was definitely scoping out <laughs> <laughs> the produce. And then there's a little box in the back that you can just open and take the eggs out. And then we have our other one down there. Um, that follows it. Um, there's, there's the other one. And so we only have a couple of our, ten of our chickens in here. And we have a bunch more chickens down at the end. Okay, Zorian, we're in front of, what is this back here? Chicken coop. And how many chickens do you have? Do you know? Um, a hundred and one. Chickens? That's chickens. a lot and of chickens. Turkeys. And seven turkeys. How many ducks? Um, ten. Sure. My peacocks. One. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about your farm? Um, that it's beautiful and I like the plants and animals. How about the food? Um, that it's good and I like it. Yeah? yeah. What Sorry. about your sister? Um, what do you like, so what do you about, like the about the farm? I like the animals mostly. Um, I mostly like watching the plants grow. What do you like about living here? Um, the view. We've got a huge view of the mountains behind our house. It's really pretty, right? How about for fun? What do you guys do for fun here? Um, ride on like a little bicycle and play soccer. Yeah. Play a lot of soccer? About the river, do you ever jump in the river? Uh, no, because my parents do that. My parents are usually not here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Anything else, Mom and Dad? Um, no, so we've been here for about a year. Two years. Farming on the land. Um, right. And we thought it'd be good to raise our kids on a farm. Uh, we don't ask them to do a lot. They will do much more this summer. And we came from France. <laughs> um, yes, we've been in Albuquerque for now three years, a year in Corrales. Before that, we traveled from overseas, from France, where I supported the Department of Energy, new energy reactor And we traveled project. all around the world. And we did travel quite a bit. So it's nice to be here on our location, right? Mm -hmm. Originally, you came to Los Alamos, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was in Los Alamos about six years ago, and then we went to France. <laughs> Um, and I worked for ITER, which is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's the new fusion reactor they're building in southern France to show um, that it's a viable energy source. The goal is a 1 to 10. You put one unit of energy and you get 10 units out. So it will revolutionize our energy. Um, it's not fission, it's not like the nuclear warhead, it's, it's actually fusion like the sun. So it's, it's, much, it's much better. Um, but currently, the kids go to school, Zorin goes to school in Corrales, Arena goes to middle school at Taylor. And me and Stephanie run our uh, GD2 Project Fusion company out of our out of our home. We only have a couple associates. Mainly do project management work. I'm doing some solar and wind work. Um, we support the pueblos, and I do do some environmental management, Department of Energy site cleanup work also. Um, and you manage this. How many acres? This is only what is it like 2.7 acres? Um, so it's small, but. Stephanie wanted a farm, so we had to get her a farm. Sorry, she wanted a garden. I wanted a garden, and 
and I got a farm. And also, she wanted a dog. Now we have two because we had a dog before that. And one's walking in the field and about to get punished. <laughs> so, so, how is it that we can get a hold of you? Do you guys have a Facebook page, a phone number, an email? On Facebook, we are A Z Family Farms, and our website is A and the number two Z Family dot farm. Now you can't Google this because we think it's the dot farm uh -uh. is too That's new our website. for Google. That's our website. That's our email. Our website's not too. Oh, okay. So our email is a number two z family farm at gmail.com. Right. And our website is www.a-zfamily.farm. farm. Right. You can always contact Stephanie directly at five zero five. 506-0841. And if you'd like to come over and visit, feel free, bring the family, we can pick a salad. Sounds great. Thank you so much, guys. You guys are a lot of fun. Thank you.